Well, good day out there. I'm Dan Stein, president of FAIR. Thank you for joining us for a Facebook discussion with Matt O'Brien, our director of research here at the Federation for American Immigration Reform. Matt and I have been talking a little bit offline and we'll resume this discussion for your benefit about the relationship between immigration and pandemics like what we're going through right now, coronavirus. Many Americans are hearing in the news a lot of stories it's breaking about efforts by advocates to get immigrant detainees, many here illegally, of course, released from prison uh, or detention. Actually, it's civil detention, not prison. Uh, many people are hearing about a lot of advocates who are saying that this law should change or that law should change as a result of the virus. But there's not a lot of discussion either about whether or not the terms of visas should be enforced in light of the changing employment picture. And you're certainly not hearing much discussion about the relationship between trans-border movement and pandemics like what we see today. So Matt, tell us a little bit about the relationship between immigration and public health. Sure, well, in the modern era, it's easy to forget that there are still viruses and bacteria all over the place that we haven't encountered yet. And every once in a while, you see these things crop up, like with the SARS outbreak and the Middle East respiratory virus outbreak. Um, the important thing to keep in mind about these is the vast majority of them don't just travel in air or on water. They tend to travel in infected livestock or transmitted by people. And so with the movement of people that you have across the globe these days by commercial airways and even by boat and train, as we've seen with the cruise ships in this particular instance, uh, people have a chance of transmitting infections. But if we plan ahead for that and we take appropriate measures without doing major inconvenience to travelers or migrants, we can get ahead of these things and be able to respond to them more efficiently than we did in this circumstance. Well, I'll look at this circumstance, <clears throat> there were allegations that there was a huge surge of uh, visitors from China who tried to come into the country or came into the country in the two weeks or so before the president imposed a travel ban in, in uh, I guess, late February, maybe it was January. Um, what do we know about that? Well, we don't know an awful lot because the Chinese government isn't sharing information. But what appears to have happened is that this broke out in China the people who were on the ground in China were experiencing the direct effects and many of them went, wow, this is a dangerous situation, I need to leave. It was only later that the Chinese government began to release information and then in that circumstance, we don't even know how forthright they were. But what this clearly shows is that <clears throat> you have a, a geographic locus for this type of outbreak people moving can spread it. And if you, you look at the situations with border control measures, Mongolia, which doesn't have a particularly robust healthcare system, closed its border almost immediately in response to this, and it has a tiny number of cases, whereas Switzerland didn't close the border with Italy because it was concerned about economic effects, both in Switzerland and Italy. And despite the fact that it has a cutting edge futuristic almost healthcare system, it's one of the places with one of the highest rates of COVID infection anywhere in the world. Well, we Americans often fancy ourselves to be the leading and most advanced country in the world. I mean, how, how well do we handle public health inspections in immigration contexts? Well, we don't, we don't handle them very well. Uh, ironically, right now, despite the fact that we, we have numerous resources, public health inspections haven't been really a part of the immigration inspections. We're doing them now in response to this specific epidemic. But the fact is, we have a U.S. public health service. We have uh, an animal and plant health inspection service that's part of Customs and Border Protection. Um, the CBP inspections of, of goods are fairly common, but we rarely have any inspections of people for health symptoms when they're traveling. Now, this is not to say that immigrants bring disease or anything of that nature. It's just the simple fact that anyone who has children in school understands that people pass along things to each other, whether it be the common cold or whether it be COVID-19. And when we know that these things occasionally crop up, like Ebola, Hantavirus, the Marburg virus, 
we know what the major symptoms are and we can take a look at these things, but we don't have any random public health surveillance going on at the airports. It's rare to find anybody from the US Public Health Service stationed at airports or major transportation hubs. So there's a layer of protection that we're missing out on that we could easily have because the infrastructure is already in place. Well, you say easily have, but really what kind of cost would that entail though to actually have that level of screening for everyone crossing the border? Well, the thing is, Dan, unless there's an ongoing outbreak, you would need to do it for everyone crossing the border. You would need to do it randomized and you would need to do it from the regions where these things are problems. So if you have somebody coming from, say, Germany, you probably wouldn't have to surveil them for Ebola virus, but flights from Africa, that would make sense. And then you need to just check a percentage of the people or people that are, that are showing obvious symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, since you have people moving through ports of entry where they're being checked for immigration papers already, and they're being checked to see if they're bringing food items into the United States, adding a few extra questions or pointing a digital thermometer at somebody would not really cost much. The, the, the cost, which is also insignificant, comes in the secondary inspection where you have a trained healthcare professional with the U.S. Public Health Service engage in a further questioning to protect both the, the American public, but the, the public, of, excuse me, the health of the people who are traveling as well. Um, and that expense we think would be relatively small. It would involve having facilities with some medical equipment and places where you could temporarily isolate people who have a potential infection. But the fact is that that would be a small alteration to existing facilities for airport and land and seaport border inspections. Well, couldn't we have a system, you know, you go into the, the TSA and you put your hands up in that little machine I guess they're checking for certain kinds of chemicals. Um, why couldn't they also check your temperature at the same time? Uh, they could. I mean, that would be an easy adaptation. That's a great example to the equipment. Um, and the fact is that a lot of the medical community is now using various types of dogs. And these aren't German Shepherds or Rottweilers. They're Golden Retrievers and Beagles. Uh, and they're training them how to actually be able to smell infections and cancer and things like that. And the uh, Department of Agriculture's program, which now belongs to CBP with the formation of the Department of Homeland Security, using beagles to do inspections for prohibited food items, uh, was very popular with the public because people enjoy it after they got off a long, stressful flight, seeing the beagles coming around and sniffing people. So this is another layer of this that you could add. Um, you could probably add a number of other different types of, of testing equipment that people wouldn't even notice. The fact is we have incredible technology um, and we have incredible resources here in the United States. And the question is, why aren't we relying on them when we know that things like this crop up? We had a heads up with SARS, we had a heads up with Ebola, and yet we really didn't pay a lot of attention to this from the immigration perspective. Well, there's this big push by agriculture, which is the raspberry seed in our wisdom teeth here at FAIR. What is the argument for, say, when they're trying to push to get these H-2A or temporary foreign workers, farm workers to come in, they're not going through any kind of medical screening on the way. What's the rationale there? Well, the rationale is that we're in a tough situation. Farmers have been having trouble allegedly finding people to pick crops, and that in a time of crisis, we need foreign mm -hmm. labor to ensure the supply chain in our food system. I, I think that's ridiculous. I mean, the fact is that the farm lobby agriculture in general gets a massive subsidy from the American taxpayer every year. They're getting an additional subsidy in the form of cheap foreign labor. That's retarding innovation and it's causing the farm industry not to develop technology and it's causing people to exploit foreign workers in order to increase profits. If we have a, a, a food supply chain management problem and we have a profit problem in agriculture right now, it's simply because American agribusiness isn't doing the things that it needs to do. When you're getting that much of a subsidy, crop insurance, price supports, and cheap immigrant labor, you should be able to turn a profit. If you're not, you're doing something wrong in your business. And there's a level of risk equal to that of agribusiness in a lot of other businesses, but those businesses don't get massive subsidies, they don't get cheap foreign labor, and yet they still manage to turn a profit.
And yet at the same time, they don't want the fight against subsidies for robotics. Or, I mean, this would be a time to introduce robotics, introduce ways of subsidizing American workers to do this kind of work. There must be a market clearing wages wage where American workers will go out and do that work. They just don't apparently have any interest in figuring out what that is. Well, yeah, and I think there are a lot of analogous jobs. Anybody that's ever watched Mike Rowe's Dirty Jobs show uh, knows that there are a lot of people who go out and do some, some tough jobs that are not easy, but they're getting paid a living wage for doing those things. In a lot of cases, they're getting paid a premium wage because the employers understand, listen, this is hot, dirty work that people won't do unless I pay them a good wage. And yet all of those employers are still continuing to turn a profit. The other aspect to this with agriculture is if you really are worried about the integrity and security of the food supply, why are you going to recruit people who are coming from places with a very low level of medical care and not give them a health screening as a required part of the process in the middle of a worldwide pandemic? That just doesn't make any sense if you stop to think about it. Well, what happens if there's a coronavirus outbreak in food processing? or harvesting in the fields? What happens? Well, the question is, we don't really know right now, but all signs, if you look at what happened on the cruise ships that that were quarantined in this situation, all signs point to the fact that that would actually increase the likelihood of an outbreak. Uh, I believe in one of the outbreaks of E. coli that was associated with fast food restaurants, they tracked that down to the actual agricultural workers in the field having Uh, issues with not hand washing and with the farmers providing a lack of sanitation facilities so that you had E. coli being transferred to the plants before they were packaged for shipment to restaurants. So in the final analysis, were there ways we could have prevented coronavirus from entering the country through stricter border control? Looking backwards and saying, if we could have done something differently, what could have been done differently? Well, the thing is with viruses and bacteria, the way they travel, you're never going to be able to completely exclude them. However, if we had locked down the borders even quicker than we did, which as I understand it was a consideration that the Trump administration was making, but because of the backlash and the accusations of racism and xenophobia, they held off a little bit on that, then we might have successfully limited the number of cases, which means Um, People in public health talk about vectors of disease. So if you have a person that's infected and then they pass that on to another person, you're increasing the size of the vector. And if we could have kept the vector smaller, then we might have limited the number of transmissions. But the fact is, Dan, we have a history of successfully managing public health in the immigration context that no one talks about anymore. Revisionist historians have, have turned it into racism. But Two of the most cutting edge hospitals in the world at the time were at Ellis Island. And they provided a lot of people immigrating to the United States with the first modern effective health care that they had ever received. And we seem to have understood back in the day that there is a public health aspect to this. You know, I think that was a lesson learned very difficultly in the uh, Spanish flu pandemic through, through hard experience. And, and so there, there were um, two hospitals at Ellis Island. The first one, which was called the Wards Island Immigrant Hospital, was on one of the smaller islands next to Ellis Island, uh, was built according to the principles that Florence Nightingale put out in a manual she published for modern hospitals. Um, that was so successful, they upgraded it and later built the, the Ellis Island Immigrant Hospital, which was the first U.S. public health service hospital. And they implemented things like autoclave sterilization of instruments, uh, using radiation to disinfect sheets and towels and uh, medical gowns and masks and things of that nature. Um, Those were all cutting edge activities, many of which were discovered to work in the context of the immigration practice. And rather than being xenophobia, this definitely was an effort to protect the American public, but there was also a genuine concern with protecting the immigrants. The feeling was we're letting these people in to live the American dream. If they're not healthy, we're doing them a disservice and they're not going to be able to benefit from the United mm-hmm. States. And I think oh, they were also, if they weren't healthy, they were sent home in some cases. Yep, that is, that is very true. Um, but they were sent home in most cases after they received treatment at the expense of the American taxpayer, which is something that's forgotten in a lot of the histories. Um, 
so I think if we were able to do this back in those days with the limited technology that's available today, with modern technology, not just in terms of equipment we can use to test people, but with modern bioanalytics, there's a lot that can be done to minimize the effects of these things and in some cases prohibit them that we just simply aren't doing. Is there any merit to the argument that if immigration levels were lower and the number of non-immigrants entering in any given day were lower, it would be far easier to be more careful about how we screen and vet people? Sure, the average immigration inspector at a U.S. airport right now has between two and four minutes to conduct an inspection of somebody crossing the border. Uh, it's slightly that longer. I would say I thought it'd be less than that. That's an average. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's significantly less than that. If you're at, and that's nationwide at all the airports. If you're at a big airport like uh, LaGuardia or O'Hare or Boston Logan, then it's it's significantly less time. In, in a lot of circumstances, it's 35 to 45 seconds. That's not enough time for somebody to screen somebody for terrorism, foreign intelligence intelligence connections, whether they have the right documents, and include something for public health. So if we had lower numbers, the, the smaller the numbers that the immigration inspectors are being asked to deal with each day, the more time they have to invest in a more thorough inspection. It also allows more time to add layers to the inspection process without backing up the airports or the land ports of entry. So reducing both legal immigration in addition to controlling illegal immigration are important. Reducing the legal immigration allows us to have more time to more effectively do these things, but more effectively policing the borders, having a physical barrier, and those things ensure that you don't have people sneaking into the country that may have a disease of, of public health significance uh, being undetected. And then we don't know that they're in Phoenix, Arizona, spreading this to, to huge numbers of people and not getting adequate medical attention. All right, last question. How's your wife like having you around the house all the time right now? Uh, <laughs> we both love to cook, Dan. So we have actually been enjoying this. We've been eating gourmet. Uh, we've been very lucky the local grocery stores aren't out of anything. Everybody's been very polite and respectful during the shopping process. So all things considered, uh, it, it, it's been uh, not too bad and things could be a lot worse. We're both lucky we're healthy and safe. And I hope the same is true of your family. I do. I miss seeing you. Yeah, I think I'll go out and bake some cookies and get myself a beagle. All right, Matt, <laughs> thanks for taking the time. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dan. I'm Dan Stein, thanks for joining us.